Good morning. Well, our Romans text today that we come to, chapter 9, brings us to a crisis of Christianity. A crisis that has cast a dark shadow over much Christian thinking for hundreds of years. A crisis of thinking that takes hold in the founding of Christendom, festers in the Dark Ages, is violently enacted during the Crusades and across the years of Inquisition, and comes to an almost unspeakable, horrific conclusion in the death camps of World War II. It is a crisis that we cannot ignore, the idea of supersessionism. Simply put, supersessionism is a Christian doctrine that suggests the new covenant through Jesus Christ replaces or supersedes the covenant that God made with Israel. The old covenant in this line of thinking is irrelevant, null and void. Now all that matters is the pathway to God through Jesus and the Christian church. As one scholar puts it, I'm reading a quote, for the supersessionist, just by continuing to exist outside the church, the Jews dissent. Let me state that again. Just by continuing to exist outside of the church, the Jews dissent. Surely we must take a moment to consider such logic. To think of such logic and how the church, for the most part of history, replaced the Jewish man called Jesus with an Aryan Jesus. And therefore, think and turn our minds to the participation of everyday Christian thinking and sim symbolism of the past millennia in anti-Semitic violence. Not surprisingly, in the aftermath of World War II, pockets of the Christian church and many Christian theologians struggled to confront the anti-Semitism that runs through the tradition. One of the significant and deeply difficult realisations that has emerged is that this doctrine of supersessionism is not in any simple way supported by the New Testament. Perhaps we've engaged in a fundamental misreading of how these holy books, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, what we call the Bible, perhaps we've engaged in a fundamental misreading of how the two hold together. Perhaps we've totally ignored the key metaphors of the New Testament, such as the new branch being grafted into Israel. And how did we miss that Paul goes to such great lengths to ward off the kinds of supersessionist thinking that comes to define much of the Christian church? And here we arrive at Romans chapter 9. And Paul says, they are the Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worships, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. And then painstakingly, Paul goes on for two chapters. So from 9 through to the end of the chapter 11, trying to unpack and grapple with the meaning of salvation in Christ and God's relationship with Israel. Concluding at the end of chapter 11, has God rejected his people? By no means. Paul's main point on this matter throughout Romans 9 to 11 is that what Christ enacts is not the replacement of God's covenant with Israel, with a covenant with the church, and certainly not the replacement of Judaism with Christianity. Rather, it's the opening up of the possibility of Gentiles being grafted onto God's covenant with Israel. That's what the Christ means, the meaning of this concept, that around and in and through the body of Jesus, Jew and Gentile are joined. It's not a logic of replacement or superseding. It's a logic of joining 
This is the metaphor that Paul uses throughout those voices of grafting, to be joined into. And later in Romans 11, addressing the Gentiles' believers, what would become the Christian church, the non-Jews, Paul writes this. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share in the rich root of the olive tree, do not boast over other branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that supports the root, but the root that supports you. So why then is Paul so sad? Because for him, he knows the Messiah has come, the culminating moment of the Jewish journey so far. And so many of his beloved Jewish community have not accepted and seen what he now believes in. Of course he's sad. He understands that many of his own people, God's people, have rejected the Messiah and totally misunderstood that God has sent a saviour for all people. So Paul's heart is broken. And while he knows that Israel and the Jewish people are by no means cut off from God, indeed they remain the chosen nation throughout his teaching and writing. That's how they remain in the Bible. God's covenant is true. But even still, Paul knows this means travelling apart for some time under this new period of history. And as he writes to the Romans, imploring the Gentile church to understand the path ahead, his heart is heavy that salvation comes under such terms. Over the last few decades, perhaps the last three or four decades, Romans chapter 9 to 11, read as a whole, has become a crucial segment of scripture in helping Christianity to come to terms with its historical supersessionism. It's a critical teaching that not only challenges our assumptions about the scripture and how it all hangs together, but confronts the church with the great violence of supersessionist thinking. From supersessionism came the logic of colonialism, the project of superseding culture, language, and civilization wherever the crown and church tra traveled to. It's a problem that's theologically traced to many of our exclusionary practices in the West today, with many Christian scholars noting the connection to theological theories of white supremacy. One Christian scholar, Willie Jennings, puts it this way, supersessionism is the womb within which whiteness or white supremacy is born. I don't have to tell you, the whole world made many promises after World War II, never again being chief among them. And the Christian church everywhere at that time committed to confronting the damage and violence of this doctrine. But the truth is, we almost never talk about it. I could count on one hand the amount of times I've heard supersessionism confronted from the pulpit. It's an ugly, shameful problem, but it's ours, and we must take up the responsibility before us. I think the Apostle Paul has shown us a way. They are the Israelites. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah, who is over all. God blessed forever. Amen. Well, it might seem ironic that among the apostles and early church leaders, it's Paul, the late-in-the-day convert, the previously great persecutor of followers of Jesus, it's Paul who becomes the radical early Christian voice. But sometimes it's like that, right? Paul was an all-in or all-out kind of guy. All sorts of these stories flew around the Jewish communities in those early years. Folks saying stuff like, remember Saul, that smug, righteous, controlling lawman 
The one that used to go around stoning women that prayed to Jesus? You know, the one that even had that little kid killed for blasphemy? Yeah, that one. Well, he's down in Damascus now telling everyone that Jesus is the Messiah. Can you believe it? But that was Paul. All in or all out. And he was all in as a persecutor and all in as a missionary. Few of the early church leaders, and certainly none of the apostles, would have known the law like Paul did. And so none would have gone through such a transformative deconstruction of belief and practice. It's likely a good reason why Paul spent years, over a decade, quietly practicing his, what would become known as Christian faith, patiently baptizing a new believer here and there, teaching in small groups, living, learning how to live among slaves and nobles before going back to Jerusalem and giving himself to that kind of leadership, the kind of leadership that would also see him move across the entire empire to plant congregations and teach. Sometimes... We have to give an awful lot of time to undo everything we thought we knew. It's easy to imagine, too, that transformation, like radical transformation, comes easy to those who undergo it. Paul had once thought that about the disciples of Jesus. You know, that they were good boys, as he had heard, who simply got caught up overnight with this charismatic would-be prophet Jesus. But when transformation came upon Paul, literally blinding him, Paul knew that a far more painful hallowing was taking place. He could feel it right down to his bones. It was as if his His skin and his flesh and his muscles and every fibrous cell was being peeled back to reveal the bare bones of who he had always been. And it had to happen. He understood that. So that new life or new flesh could grow and make even his dead bones live. But it was lonely. Everyone Paul had ever been close to, those he knew and loved, looked at him like a stranger now. It's like they looked through him to the muddled memory of somebody they used to know. Not many people know what it's like to really have to start all over, to start all over again, to not have a single person in the world with whom you share a history or have an inside joke or hold together the scars and joys of life lived together. But Paul did. Everything was small talk back then. Everyone was a new acquaintance, all small talk. But then the big talk of Jesus. Paul sometimes laughed at himself at the extremes of it all. Of course I would find myself here, he thought. But if he was hurting and he was lonely, he was even more vulnerable. I mean, Paul had been above the law, man. He was the blameless one. No one among the Jewish community, not even those who hated him, could come after him for anything. But now, as a follower of Jesus, he was being pursued everywhere he went. And he was starting to find himself in jail cells with alarming regularity. But that wasn't the worst. In those dark weeks and months, and if he's honest, years of transformation... It was the endless feeling of fragility, exposure, that really got to him. He'd put it all on the line. He'd opened himself up to be made new in every possible way. And, oh, Lord, did it feel intensely raw. Sometimes you've just got to hold on and believe that time will care for your vulnerability. And that transformation is worth it. 
It's easy to think that Paul was the bravest. Paul knew that most folk thought he was brave. People had been saying that about him his whole life, as if speaking up and speaking loud just came easy to him. I mean, sure, he could see that it was probably a bit easier for him than some people, but it wasn't that. It's just, well, it's who he was. He couldn't be anyone else. It cost him a lot and it always cost him trouble. He knew that. When he crossed paths with Peter or Cephas, as the book of Galatians refers to him, in that Jerusalem town, Antioch, this great apostle of the church, Paul knew something was about to happen. I mean, can you believe it? There they were. Peter and the other Jews for weeks, eating with the strangers, eating with the Gentiles. Those uncircumcised believers sitting down and praying and sharing in the Lord's meal, literally holding hands and doing life together. Some were slaves, some were nobles, but they were all together. It was just as it was supposed to be. The radical kingdom that Jesus, our Lord, had revealed to Peter. It was, it was beautiful. But then, when James's disciples turned up, holier than the Pharisees, suddenly it's all off. Suddenly Peter only sits at the table of the Jews. Suddenly Peter only breaks bread with those of Israel, those who were circumcised. Paul could tell that Peter was afraid of this group. He wanted to impress his powerful friends and shore up these connections for the upcoming Jerusalem Council. It was the first council of the church. It was, as it so often is, all about building allies and having power. And Paul was disgusted. One afternoon, Paul saw a young believer, a kid of about 10 or 11, that Paul knew had been converted in Damascus and travelled to Jerusalem, as so many of those early Gentile believers did, wanting to visit the holy city. He was a scrappy little kid, dirty, smelly. You might not notice him, but gosh, he was full of the Lord's spirit. And he ran up to the main house shouting, Brother Peter, Brother Peter, I've just found the most delicious, juicy figs for you to eat. He was so excited. Peter turned sharply to the child and looked down coldly. You are no brother of mine. Get away from me, slave boy. Paul knew he was about to start something. He could feel the speech forming in the back of his throat and he sensed danger. He said a little prayer for God to guide him, give him some wisdom, please. Truth is... Paul was afraid, but it's fear that makes way for courage, isn't it? Sometimes, now is the time to stand up for radical inclusiveness. And thy kingdom comes. Amen.